the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested,
washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransom. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had won. But then Jesus arose with all freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose. We are so thankful and glad that you are joining us this morning. We are going to be kicking off a, a new series starting today, and we'll go into that in just a moment. But before we go there, I'd like for you just to take a moment to check in with me, please, if you would. Would you take a minute, grab your cell phone, and text to the number on your screen, 408 547 4911, the word connect. If you have never uh, checked in with us before, type in the word connect and then follow the prompts, put your first name in there and whatever other information they're asking for. If you have checked in with us before, just text your first name and the word here. And that just helps us to know who is watching online and who's joining us uh, in this venue right here. I uh, also want to encourage you to continue to give. If you will uh, also text the word give to that number, 408-547-4911, and follow those prompts. That will take you to the giving section of our website, and you can uh, give one time or recurring. We just appreciate your faithfulness. We appreciate your generosity. Thank you to those of you who have been watching online over the course of this past year or so and have been uh, faithful in your support of us uh, through your giving in the online portal. So thank you. Thank you very much. Also, um, in just a moment, uh, we're going to be heading into our message, but I just want to give a huge shout out to our worship team and to our work crew. Uh, these last two weeks have been a, uh, an amazing two weeks for us with the 
uh, communion service and the five baptisms the, two weeks ago and then last week with our Mother's Day celebration. Uh, they just knocked it out of the park uh, during our um, on the lawn in your car uh, live uh, gathering. And so we're so thankful for that. Join with me this morning as we take a look at uh, the um, seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. And we'll go into that in in a minute, but I just want to kind of give a little bit of a background as to where we're, where we're going, what direction we're going to be taking uh, with our services over the, over the course of the next uh, few weeks. Uh, but I want to talk about foundations. I want to talk about how important it is that we have a strong foundation in our faith. As we look at this, we're going to be focusing on what it means to be a follower of Christ. And in order to be a true follower, we must have a strong foundation on which we are standing in order for our faith to be truly effective in our lives. So basically, your foundation matters. Your foundation matters. But before we get to the, to the text that I want to focus on, I want to take a look at some uh, verses that precede our text in the seventh chapter of Matthew. In the, uh, in the seventh chapter, we find Jesus is is addressing the difference between those who will enter heaven and those who will not. And I think this is a very serious question that many were trying to find the answer for at that time, but I think many of us are trying to find the answer for that as well during our time. In Matthew chapter 19, he refers to a, an encounter he has with a rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler asked how he might obtain eternal life. And then Jesus went into uh, an explanation and kind of a banter dialogue with him at that time. But in this situation, um, we are, we're looking at kind of a succession of verses where Jesus is laying some groundwork in his um, interaction with the disciples and the people that he is uh, engaging with. So um, have you ever uh, wondered um, about eternal life? Have you ever wondered what it takes to obtain eternal life? Well, I think the rich young ruler speaks for all of us, or we wouldn't be here right now. How do we obtain eternal life? C.S. Lewis said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ." If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, and even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. And he goes on to say, God became man for no other purpose. When we look at becoming a follower of Christ, it is so important to realize the groundwork that Jesus is trying to lay in order to explain how important it is that we have a strong foundation. In the 13th verse of that 7th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is given the example of the narrow gate and the wide gate. The narrow gate that leads to life and the wide gate that leads to destruction. The narrow gate, only few will find it. The wide gate, many will enter through it. And then he goes on in verse 15, and he compares the false prophets of that time or of that era to, um, to fruit on a tree. He says, a good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree, the false prophet, will bear bad fruit. But then in verse 21, he addresses a present-day dilemma. You see, we live in a culture where everyone thinks they are going to heaven. Talk to anyone uh, any person, and they call themselves a Christian, and they believe just because they call themselves a Christian, they have no idea what it means to be a Christ follower, but they'll label themselves a Christian, and you ask them why, and, and so many of them cannot tell you why, or they'll say, well, I'm a good person. You know, how can God not allow a good person to go to heaven? Well, I want to tell you that it, it is so important that we understand that. So he says in verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who was in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, 
Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus said, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Man, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be in for a rude awakening when they stand before God thinking that they're going to be going to heaven. And I pray that that won't be any of us, any of you, as we, as we understand the, the, um, the impact that Jesus is trying to bring out in, in this next story, which is going to be our, our text. But then here we, we get a little bit more detail of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And although the previous verses that we addressed, the gates and the trees, the false prophets and the ill-advised believers, and let me say that just because one believes in Jesus, it doesn't necessarily validate their relationship with him because the Bible says that even the demons believe and they, and they shudder. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a look at our text, which is the next three or four verses, and we're going to see that everyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus is either characterized as a listener, a leaner, and a learner. And I'll break those down for you as we go through that. How many of you remember school? Uh, let's say, for instance, high school. How many of you remember high school? Or some of you are already are, are in high school right now or just headed into high school. And for some of you, school has been or is or was a good experience and you love the environment, you got good or great grades and, and, and it, was, it was a piece of cake. Yeah, I mean, you, you fit right in with the right crowd. It was, a, it was a, a, a great four years. And then some of you, it wasn't so great. It wasn't such a good experience. And I don't know about you, but I hated high school. I barely got through uh, my grade point was a 2.7, and uh, even that was just getting by with the skin of my teeth. Um, the thing about my graduating class back in 1978 in Jefferson, Iowa, we were ranked in the nation in the 95th percentile. Yep, we had a class filled with people that were absolute intelligent brainiacs. In fact, we had... Uh, several that, that uh, scored perfect scores on the ACT test. Many of them were like one or two points away from scoring a perfect score. Me, I scored a 19. Somebody I told that to the other day said, oh my gosh, that's great. And I said, no, the, the perfect score is 34. And I was, I was far from that. In fact, I was the one that I think kept us from reaching the, the a higher level of percentile of our, our, our class um, uh, test scores back at that time. I think I was the one that brought us down to the 95%. I hated high school, hated it. But when I got to college, it was a totally different story. I absolutely fell in love with school, fell in love with learning, and I became part of the dean's list. And in my junior college, I was salutatorian, second in my class. I actually tied for first. But, I, um, but because the, the one who uh, was given the valedictorian took one more class than I did at the school, they gave her the valedictorian and me the salutatorian. Um, I, I uh, graduated magna cum laude. Um, I graduated uh, uh, summa cum laude at uh, my um, my Bible college career, I, I finished with a, I think a three, six grade point average. I mean, I just absolutely loved school. What was your best subject? I ask kids that nowadays, and many of them say lunch or PE. Um, a few might say math or English or, or another subject. And, and uh, when I was in uh, college, one of my loves was, um, was history. And I, I had a pretty amazing experience, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit as well, with a um, history course that I took in my junior college uh, time. You see, being a disciple is similar to going to school. We have to put ourselves, when we call ourselves a follower of Christ, we have to put ourselves in a situation to be a student, 
to learn or want to learn. You see, it is this analogy or parable that Jesus shares that we will see how important your foundation matters. So as we look at Matthew chapter 7, follow along with me if you would, and uh, as we look at verses 24 through 27, and uh, it says, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man, a fool, who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and they beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I just want to take um, our time together this morning and take a look at the, the, the first sentence and, and the, um, the introduction that Jesus is making to the crowd. Next week, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, the, the, um, the foundation of the rock, but today I want to talk about you know, how important it is that we understand that to, um, to look at what Jesus is trying to uh, say characterizes a disciple, we see that the characteristics of a disciple are that he is a listener, a leaner, and a learner. A listener, a leaner, and a learner. Well, when he's talking about a listener, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. In other words, we, we need to listen to what the speaker is saying. Now, obviously, there is a teacher from whom we are learning, so we need to choose who our teacher will be and what we will listen to. You see, there's all kinds of voices out there. There's all kinds of things that are trying to teach us and to train us, but we have to be selective, and Jesus is saying, everyone who hears what these words of mine. He was personalizing it. When you hear my words, he said, you need to listen. We must place ourselves in situations where we have to listen to instruction from whom we choose to listen to. You see, this could be a pastor, this could be a mentor, a teacher, Jesus himself, his words, the Bible, uh, a Bible study. We have to we have to choose whom we're going to listen to. And where does this happen best? It happens on Sundays, Sunday mornings. It happens in small groups. It, has, it happens in places where God's word is being taught, where God's people are gathering. And we are putting ourselves in a position to listen to what is being taught. You can go to a class, and guess what? You can choose whether you're going to listen or not. How many of you remember school and those subjects that you hated, those subjects that you, that you struggled with, and, and as soon as the class would begin, you would check out. Nowadays, because we didn't have cell phones back then, they make the students check their cell phones in before they take their seat so that they're not distracted so that they could listen better to what is being taught. That didn't help me at all. I mean, I didn't even have a cell phone and to be distracted with. I found other things to distract myself with. If I didn't want to learn, I didn't listen. How many of you used to skip or ditch class? Now, please don't talk to my wife about that because um, she might tell you a few stories about her school uh, career and uh, some of the classes that she would skip or ditch. Don't tell her I told you that. Now, I know some of you right now are getting on your cell phones, getting ready to call her and say, hey, pastor just threw you under the bus, so you're going to throw me on the, under the bus just right behind her. I know you are. I know most of you. But how many of you remember skipping and ditching class? Well, how many of us do the same thing? We, we don't go to church. We don't get involved in a small group. We don't put ourselves in a position where something is being taught and we are listening to the word of God. So what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? How many of you remember the game we used to play as kids, Simon Says? The crux of the game was to see how well you what? You listened. 
the better you listened and you didn't get distracted by the movement of the Simon, the better you fared in the game. Because many times we're watching the, the, the person who was Simon and they're giving instructions and Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch your knees. Simon says, put your hands on your waist, touch your ears. And so we, we follow the movement and we don't listen if they said Simon says. So that was the crux of the game. Well, in life, we do the same thing. If we're not listening to the words of God, then we're following whatever movement is going on all around us. And we need to be listeners. The second thing uh, we need to do is we need to be a leaner. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by being a leaner? Well, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice and put, it's, it's an action. And what is a leaner? When I was in class, boy, if I didn't want to be in that class, man, my arms were folded, my feet were kicked out in front of me, and there's a few classes that I fell asleep in. And, and it wasn't because I got up early or, or worked too hard. It was because I didn't want to be in that class, and the class just bored me to sleep. Well, a lot of times when things are happening with, within the spiritual uh, development of our lives, we get bored or we don't want to learn. And so we cross our arms, we kick our legs out, and we take a nap. And we fall asleep. And we live our faith by falling asleep rather than leaning in. See, when, when, when I want to hear something, when I want to learn something, and something has gripped my attention, has gripped my heart, what am I going to do? I'm going to lean in. Because I want to listen more intently. And when we think about listening to the word of God and putting it into practice, putting is, is that leaning in and, and it's the beginning of, of taking that which you're learning and it's, and, it's, and it's assimilating that in your life. And life change begins to happen. Life change begins to uh, 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 percolate and formulate in your life and in your heart. Because now you're starting about taking what you're learning and putting it into action. It's very important that we, we learn how to lean in when it comes to hearing God's word. This, learn, or this, this leaner is a listener who begins to engage in what they are hearing. How many of you remember the childhood game, Follow the Leader? The better you were at what? Following the better chance you had to win the game or to stay engaged in the game. You see, the same thing is true as a follower of Christ. The closer we follow, the more we lean in, the better the chance we have of finishing strong. And well, I don't know about you, but I'm watching a lot of um, faith leaders that are not finishing well. Why is that? It's because they quit leaning. They, they quit leaning in, they, they, they quit the application and the, and the putting into practice the Word of God. You see, when I was in community college, my goal was to get my AA degree and then figure out where and what God wanted me to do and where He wanted me to go from there. What I didn't count on was finding a class, a course uh, in American history that absolutely just gripped my heart and my mind. I began to lean in. I wanted to saturate myself in the subject. And I almost went into teaching until God revealed more of his direction in my life. And I wanted to teach American history, world history. I wanted to teach history itself because this instructor who was a pot smoking, hippie, laid back, kind of uh, it just uh, kind of that one of those guys that, that just had this, this uh, view on life. He was an atheist, hated God, didn't want anything to do with him. But, but the way he taught caused me to lean in to want to learn from him the subject of history. And the third thing, the verse goes on to say, therefore everyone who hears, listens, these words of mine and puts, leans them into practice, becomes a learner. Now, a learner isn't the 
uh, the gathering of information, and I'll define that a little bit, little bit better. But in order to truly understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ, is, is, or, or in order to be discipled, is to understand that we are a student of a master, a student of a teacher. There's an ancient Jewish blessing that supposedly goes like this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. The idea is that a rabbi's disciples, those who, who, who take on his, his uh, lifestyle, who take on his teaching, or in, in, in the, the Jewish connotation of that, who take on his yoke, then it is, it is these people who begin to follow his set interpretations of scripture. And they were to follow so closely behind them that when they walked, they would become caked in the dust that he kicked up with his feet. And in that day, roads and, and everything were dirt and dusty and, and mud caked. And what it is saying is that you're following so closely that the person walking in front of you, your rabbi, as he's walking and the dust is coming up off of his feet or the mud is being slung back from his feet, you are, you are covered in it. That's how close you are following your rabbi. You see, the blessing had a literal meaning, but was primarily metaphoric, and that the common Christian saying, following in the footsteps of Jesus, conveys the same idea. And that's found in 1 John chapter 2, 6, where John wrote, whoever claims to live in him, Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. And so we are to follow in the footsteps of the one to whom we are uh, given the, um, the, uh, the title of teacher or rabbi. So one who is a learner is one that's not just gathering the information, but he applies, he follows after, he, he mimics, he, uh, he duplicates the life of the one he is following through what they have learned. You see, practice, he says, if you put lean into practice, learn. So what you're, what you're learning is you're putting into practice, you're applying, you're, 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 you're walking out to see how, how, um, how, you can, uh, how you can mold and shape the direction of your life according to what you are learning. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will. What does he mean? You see, far too often as a disciple, we spend most of our time battling our old nature. In other words, we, we, try, we spend most of our time trying not to sin. Or, or, or trying not to engage in behaviors that we left to come to follow after Christ. Where the idea of being a disciple is, is not spending so much time avoiding the old nature, it's learning how to apply the new nature. It's learning how to become more like Jesus. It's, it, it's learning how to be more like Jesus, not how to quit sinning. And I think many of us, think that that's what discipleship is, is, is we, the, the less sin we do, then the better disciple we are. It's not what a disciple is. The more we become like our teacher, like our rabbi, like Jesus, by putting into practice, by, by learning how to do it the right way, then that's what defines our being a disciple. Do you see yourself? As a disciple slash follower of Christ? If so, do you see yourself as a student who's willing to, who's, who's willing to, to listen, lean, and learn? You see, James points out that there's a big difference between being a professor of our faith versus a possessor of our faith. He says, talk is cheap because faith is more than just something you say. You see, how many people do you know that profess their faith 
or claim to be a Christian, but then you take a look at the fruit of their, their lives and you say, uh, no, no, they're really not. I love it when all these big sports stars talk about uh, uh, giving glory to God, but then every other word out of their mouth is a swear word or, or they're engaged in some kind of uh, fight posture or, or they're, they're um, living with a, with a girlfriend or they have, very, have numerous girlfriends that they are spending their time with and, and sleeping around with and, and, and you go, wait a minute, they, they just said that they were a Christian and they just were giving God glory. But man, that, that, that just doesn't line up with what the master is teaching us and the direction or the way in which he would want us to, to walk. James says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And then in verses, that's in James 1.21, in James 1.22 through 25, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Man, powerful. Don't just listen, do it. Don't, don't just be a, a listener. Lean in and learn. Lean in and put it into practice, is what he's saying. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, he says, but doing it, they will be blessed and what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses wrote in verses 1 and 2, be careful to follow every command I am giving you. In other words, be careful to, to listen, to lean, and to learn. So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to do what? To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. I love that idea. Going to school, what do you do? You, you sit in on a class, and, and what does that teacher do to see if you're learning? Gives you a test. You see, that's what God does with us. He gives us a test in order to see if we are actually learning what he's teaching us and how do we do in that test and so this whole dynamic of the of the illustration Jesus is saying everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man see that's your test is if you're putting into practice what you're learning and if you are then you're wise but if you are not putting into practice, hearing the same message the wise man heard, but you're choosing not to apply that to your life, then you're a foolish man, he says. You see, in this story, let me read it quickly again. Uh, everyone who hears these words of mine, puts them into practice, is a wise man who built his house on the rock. Rains came down, streams rose, winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had what? Its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came down, streams rose, winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So what do we have? We have two people. And they both heard the same word. And the difference was one applied and the other did not. They both built houses. They both faced storms, the rain, the streams, the winds. But what was the difference? It wasn't a different storm. It wasn't a worse storm for the, for the house that crashed. It, it wasn't a, a lighter storm for the house that survived. It, it, it wasn't that one was a, a, an extraordinary builder and the other one wasn't. You see, every, every variable there was the same. 
pretty much. Except one obeyed and the other did not. And what was the major difference in that? Their foundation. Their foundation. And we're going to talk next week about what that foundation looks like when we compare it to the rock. So you're going to want to be able to, to, uh, to join us next week as well. But it's important for us to understand that the idea of, of what happened with these foundations is because your foundation matters when it comes to your work and your walk with the Lord. God is not interested in how much scripture you know. He wants to know how much scripture has a hold of you. He wants to know how much scripture is in you, illuminating and, and challenging and changing your life. There are people who read the Bible every day and they still don't know or trust God enough for their daily needs. In other words, you can read and know God's word, but if you don't put it into practice, in other words, live it out, then you are a fool building your life as one would build their house on sand. Jim, Put, Jim Putnam, pastor's real life church in, um, in Idaho, and he said, far too many of us assume that discipleship is merely the transfer of information leading to behavior modification. How many of us think that that's what discipleship is? You learn something and, and it changes, or you, you have to change your behavior. But discipleship, he says, at heart involves transformation at the deepest levels of our understanding, affection, and will by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God and in relationship with the people of God. God wants to transform your life. And the way He does it is if we have these characteristics um, involved in our life, that we are listening, that we are leaning, and that we are learning. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. This morning, I want us to be wise. This morning, I want us to be a people of God who realize and understand the importance that your foundation in Christ matters. And it will make all the difference in the world when you face trials of many kinds, the storms of life, the, the, the rain and the, and the streams and the winds of life. As we close this morning, um, you may be struggling right now with your foundation. Would you make a commitment this morning? Would you make a commitment in your heart to listen more intently? to lean in a little closer and to listen or excuse me or to and to learn in the sense of of applying more deeply the truths of the word of god to every aspect of your life this morning i want to challenge you to listen with me to lean in with me and to learn with me what it means truly be a disciple of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word that changes our life. Because that's what Jesus said. Those that hear these words of mine. And so God, we want to listen to your words. We want to lean in as you speak. And we want to learn by applying, by practicing these things in our life. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. Amen. God bless you as you, um, as you close out this time with me and as we segue into a time of worship with our worship team, I want to encourage you, if you have a prayer request with you this morning, would you text on the number on your screen, would you text the word prayer to 
4911. And then just a little bit about what we, you would like for us to pray with you about. We want to join with you. We want to know that the struggles of life are very real. And uh, we have a very real and powerful God who wants to bring answers to your prayer. And would you allow us to pray with you for that? God bless you. Um, take a moment and just worship with us as we close out our service today. God bless you and see you next time. the goodness.